Chapter Seven of the Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. The Journey to the Great Oz. They were obliged to camp out that night under a large tree in the forest, for there were no houses near. The tree made a good thick covering to protect them from the dew, and the tin woodman chopped a great pile of wood with his axe, and Dorothy built a splendid fire that warmed her and made her feel less lonely. She and Toto ate the last of their bread, and now she did not know what they would do for breakfast. "'If you wish,' said the lion, "'I will go into the forest and kill a deer for you. You can roast it by the fire, since your tastes are so peculiar that you prefer cooked food, and then you will have a very good breakfast.' "'Don't, please don't,' begged the tin woodman. "'I should certainly weep if you killed a poor deer, and then my jaws would rust again.' But the lion went away into the forest and found his own supper, and no one ever knew what it was, for he didn't mention it. And the scarecrow found a tree full of nuts and filled Dorothy's basket with them, so that she would not be hungry for a long time. She thought this was very kind and thoughtful of the scarecrow, but she laughed heartily at the awkward way in which the poor creature picked up the nuts. His padded hands were so clumsy, and the nuts were so small, that he dropped almost as many as he put in the basket. But the scarecrow did not mind how long it took him to fill the basket, for it enabled him to keep away from the fire, as he feared a spark might get into his straw and burn him up. So he kept a good distance away from the flames, and only came near to cover Dorothy with dry leaves when she lay down to sleep. These kept her very snug and warm, and she slept soundly until morning. When it was daylight the girl bathed her face in a little rippling brook, and soon after they all started toward the Emerald City. This was to be an eventful day for the travelers. They had hardly been walking an hour when they saw before them a great ditch that crossed the road and divided the forest as far as they could see on either side. It was a very wide ditch, and when they crept up to the edge and looked into it, they could see it was also very deep, and there were many big jagged rocks at the bottom. The sides were so steep that none of them could climb down, and for a moment it seemed that their journey must end. "'What shall we do?' asked Dorothy despairingly. "'I haven't the faintest idea,' said the tin woodman and the lion shook his shaggy mane and looked thoughtful. But the scarecrow said, "'We cannot fly, that is certain. Neither can we climb down into this great ditch. Therefore, if we cannot jump over it, we must stop where we are.' "'I think I could jump over it,' said the cowardly lion, after measuring the distance carefully in his mind. "'Then we are all right,' answered the scarecrow for you can carry us all over on your back one at a time. Well, I'll try it, said the lion. Who will go first? I will, declared the scarecrow, for if you found that you could not jump over the gulf, Dorothy would be killed or the tin woodman badly dented on the rocks below. But if I am on your back it will not matter so much, for the fall would not hurt me at all. I am terribly afraid of falling myself said the cowardly lion, but I suppose there is nothing to do but try it. So get on my back, and we will make the attempt." The scarecrow sat upon the lion's back, and the big beast walked to the edge of the gulf and crouched down. "'Why don't you run and jump?' asked the scarecrow. "'Because that isn't the way we lions do things,' he replied. Then giving a great spring he shot through the air and landed safely on the other side. They were all greatly pleased to see how easily he did it, and after the scarecrow had got down from his back, the lion sprang across the ditch again. Dorothy thought she would go next, so she took Toto in her arms and climbed on the lion's back, holding tightly to his mane with one hand. The next moment it seemed as if she were flying through the air. And then, before she had time to think about it, she was safe on the other side. The lion went back a third time and got the tin woodman, and then they all sat down for a few moments to give the beast a chance to rest, 
for his great leaps had made his breath short, and he panted like a big dog that has been running too long. They found the forest very thick on this side, and it looked dark and gloomy. After the lion had rested, they started along the road of yellow brick, silently wondering, each in his own mind, if ever they would come to the end of the woods and reach the bright sunshine again. To add to their discomfort, they soon heard strange noises in the depths of the forest, and the lion whispered to them that it was in this part of the country that the Kalidas lived. "'What are the Kalidas?' asked the girl. They are monstrous beasts, with bodies like bears and heads like tigers," replied the lion, and with claws so long and sharp that they could tear me in two as easily as I could kill Toto. I'm terribly afraid of the Kalidas. I'm not surprised that you are, returned Dorothy. They must be dreadful beasts. The lion was about to reply when suddenly they came to another gulf across the road. But this one was so broad and deep that the lion knew at once he could not leap across it. So they sat down to consider what they should do, and after serious thought the scarecrow said, Here is a great tree standing close to the ditch. If the tin woodman can chop it down, so that it will fall to the other side, we can walk across it easily. That is a first-rate idea, said the lion. One would almost suspect you had brains in your head instead of straw. The woodman set to work at once, and so sharp was his axe that the tree was soon chopped nearly through. Then the lion put his strong front legs against the tree and pushed with all his might, and slowly the big tree tipped and fell with a crash across the ditch with its top branches on the other side. They had just started to cross this queer bridge, when a sharp growl made them all look up, and to their horror they saw running toward them two great beasts with bodies like bears and heads like tigers. "'They are the Kalidas,' said the cowardly lion, beginning to tremble. "'Quick!' cried the scarecrow. "'Let us cross over.' So Dorothy went first, holding Toto in her arms. The tin woodman followed, and the scarecrow came next. The lion, although he was certainly afraid, turned to face the Kalidas, and then he gave so loud and terrible a roar that Dorothy screamed, and the scarecrow fell over backward, while even the fierce beasts stopped short and looked at him in surprise. But, seeing they were bigger than the lion, and remembering that there were two of them and only one of him, the Kalidas again rushed forward, and the lion crossed over the tree and turned to see what they would do next. Without stopping an instant, the fierce beasts also began to cross the tree, and the lion said to Dorothy, "'We are lost, for they will surely tear us to pieces with their sharp claws.' but stand close behind me, and I will fight them as long as I am alive." "'Wait a minute,' called the Scarecrow. He had been thinking what was best to be done, and now he asked the woodman to chop away the end of the tree that rested on their side of the ditch. The tin woodman began to use his axe at once, and just as the two Kalidas were nearly across, the tree fell with a crash into the gulf carrying the ugly, snarling brutes with it, and both were dashed to pieces on the sharp rocks at the bottom. Well, said the cowardly lion, drawing a long breath of relief, I see we are going to live a little while longer, and I am glad of it, for it must be a very uncomfortable thing not to be alive. Those creatures frightened me so badly that my heart is beating yet. Ah, said the tin woodman sadly, I wish I had a heart to beat. This adventure made the travelers more anxious than ever to get out of the forest, and they walked so fast that Dorothy became tired and had to ride on the lion's back. To their great joy the trees became thinner the farther they advanced, and in the afternoon they suddenly came upon a broad river flowing swiftly just before them. 
On the other side of the water they could see the road of yellow brick running through a beautiful country, with green meadows dotted with bright flowers and all the road bordered with trees hanging full of delicious fruits. They were greatly pleased to see this delightful country before them. "'How shall we cross the river?' asked Dorothy. "'That is easily done,' replied the Scarecrow. "'The Tin Woodman must build us a raft so we can float to the other side.' So the Woodman took his axe and began to chop down small trees to make a raft, and while he was busy at this the Scarecrow found on the river bank a tree full of fine fruit. This pleased Dorothy, who had eaten nothing but nuts all day, and she made a hearty meal of the ripe fruit. But it takes time to make a raft, even when one is as industrious and untiring as the Tin Woodman, and when night came the work was not done. So they found a cozy place under the trees where they slept well until the morning, and Dorothy dreamed of the Emerald City and of the good Wizard of Oz, who would soon send her back to her own home again. End of chapter 7 The Deadly Poppy Field Our little party of travelers awakened the next morning refreshed and full of hope, and Dorothy breakfasted like a princess off peaches and plums from the trees beside the river. Behind them was the dark forest they had passed safely through, although they had suffered many discouragements. But before them was a lovely sunny country that seemed to beckon them on to the Emerald City. To be sure, the broad river now cut them off from this beautiful land. But the raft was nearly done, and after the tin woodman had cut a few more logs and fastened them together with wooden pins, they were ready to start. Dorothy sat down in the middle of the raft and held Toto in her arms. When the cowardly lion stepped upon the raft, it tipped badly, for he was big and heavy, but the scarecrow and the tin woodman stood upon the other end to steady it, and they had long poles in their hands to push the raft through the water. They got along quite well at first, but when they reached the middle of the river, the swift current swept the raft downstream farther and farther away from the road of yellow brick and the water grew so deep that the long poles would not touch the bottom. "'This is bad,' said the tin woodman, "'for if we cannot get to the land we shall be carried into the country of the Wicked Witch of the West, and she will enchant us and make us her slaves.' "'And then I should get no brains,' said the scarecrow, "'and I should get no courage,' said the cowardly lion, "'and I should get no heart,' said the tin woodman. "'And I should never get back to Kansas,' said Dorothy. "'We must certainly get to the Emerald City if we can,' the Scarecrow continued, and he pushed so hard on his long pole that it stuck fast in the mud at the bottom of the river. Then before he could pull it out again or let go, the raft was swept away, and the poor Scarecrow left clinging to the pole in the middle of the river. "'Good-bye,' he called after them and they were very sorry to leave him. Indeed, the tin woodman began to cry, but fortunately remembered that he might rust, and so dried his tears on Dorothy's apron. Of course this was a bad thing for the scarecrow. I am now worse off than when I first met Dorothy, he thought. Then I was stuck on a pole in a cornfield, where I could make believe scare the crows at any rate. But surely there is no use for a scarecrow stuck on a pole in the middle of a river. I am afraid I shall never have any brains after all. Down the stream the raft floated, and the poor scarecrow was left far behind. Then the lion said, Something must be done to save us. I think I can swim to the shore and pull the raft after me, if you will only hold fast to the tip of my tail. So he sprang into the water, and the tin woodman caught fast hold of his tail. Then the lion began to swim with all his might toward the shore. It was hard work, although he was so big, but by and by they were drawn out of the current, and then Dorothy took the tin woodman's long pole and helped push the raft to the land. They were all tired out when they reached the shore at last and stepped off upon the pretty green grass, 
and they also knew that the stream had carried them a long way past the road of yellow brick that led to the emerald city what shall we do now asked the tin woodman as the lion lay down on the grass to let the sun dry him we must get back to the road in some way said dorothy the best plan will be to walk along the river bank until we come to the road again remarked the lion so when they were rested dorothy picked up her basket and they started along the grassy bank to the road from which the river had carried them it was a lovely country with plenty of flowers and fruit trees and sunshine to cheer them and had they not felt so sorry for the poor scarecrow they could have been very happy they walked along as fast as they could dorothy only stopping once to pick a beautiful flower and after a time the tin woodman cried out look then they all looked at the river and saw the scarecrow perched upon his pole in the middle of the water looking very lonely and sad what can we do to save him asked dorothy the lion and the woodman both shook their heads for they did not know so they sat down upon the bank and gazed wistfully at the scarecrow until a stork flew by who upon seeing them stopped to rest at the water's edge who are you and where are you going asked the stork i am dorothy answered the girl and these are my friends the tin woodman and the cowardly lion and we are going to the emerald city this isn't the road said the stork as she twisted her long neck and looked sharply at the queer party i know it returned dorothy but we have lost the scarecrow and are wondering how we shall get him again where is he asked the stork over there in the river answered the little girl if he wasn't so big and heavy i would get him for you remarked the stork he isn't heavy a bit said dorothy eagerly for he is stuffed with straw and if you will bring him back to us we shall thank you ever and ever so much well i'll try said the stork but if i find he is too heavy to carry i shall have to drop him in the river again so the big bird flew into the air and over the water till she came to where the scarecrow was perched upon his pole then the stork with her great claws grabbed the scarecrow by the arm and carried him up into the air and back to the bank where dorothy and the lion and the tin woodman and toto were sitting when the scarecrow found himself among his friends again he was so happy that he hugged them all even the lion and toto and as they walked along he sang to the rio do at every step he felt so gay i was afraid i should have to stay in that river forever he said but the kind stork saved me and if i ever get any brains i shall find the stork again and do her some kindness in return that's all right said the stork who was flying along beside them i always like to help anyone in trouble but i must go now for my babies are waiting in the nest for me i hope you will find the emerald city and that oz will help you thank you replied dorothy and then the kind stork flew into the air and was soon out of sight they walked along listening to the singing of the brightly colored birds and looking at the lovely flowers which now became so thick that the ground was carpeted with them there were big yellow and white and blue and purple blossoms beside great clusters of scarlet poppies which were so brilliant in color they almost dazzled dorothy's eyes aren't they beautiful the girl asked as she breathed in the spicy scent of the bright flowers i suppose so answered the scarecrow when i have brains i shall probably like them better if i only had a heart i should love them added the tin woodman i always did like flowers said the lion they seem so helpless and frail but there are none in the forest so bright as these they now came upon more and more of the big scarlet poppies and fewer and fewer of the other flowers and soon they found themselves in the midst of a great meadow of poppies now it is well known that when there are many of these flowers together 
their odor is so powerful that anyone who breathes it falls asleep and if the sleeper is not carried away from the scent of the flowers he sleeps on and on forever but dorothy did not know this nor could she get away from the bright red flowers that were everywhere about so presently her eyes grew heavy and she felt she must sit down to rest and to sleep but the tin woodman would not let her do this we must hurry and get back to the road of yellow brick before dark he said and the scarecrow agreed with him so they kept walking until dorothy could stand no longer her eyes closed in spite of herself and she forgot where she was and fell among the poppies fast asleep what shall we do asked the tin woodman if we leave her here she will die said the lion the smell of the flowers is killing us all i myself can scarcely keep my eyes open and the dog is asleep already it was true toto had fallen down beside his little mistress but the scarecrow and the tin woodman not being made of flesh were not troubled by the scent of the flowers run fast said the scarecrow to the lion and get out of this deadly flower bed as soon as you can we will bring the little girl with us but if you should fall asleep you are too big to be carried so the lion roused himself and bounded forward as fast as he could go in a moment he was out of sight let us make a chair with our hands and carry her said the scarecrow so they picked up toto and put the dog in dorothy's lap and then they made a chair with their hands for the seat and their arms for the arms and carried the sleeping girl between them through the flowers on and on they walked and it seemed that the great carpet of deadly flowers that surrounded them would never end they followed the bend of the river and at last came upon their friend the lion lying fast asleep among the poppies the flowers had been too strong for the huge beast and he had given up at last and fallen only a short distance from the end of the poppy bed where the sweet grass spread in beautiful green fields before them we can do nothing for him said the tin woodman sadly for he is much too heavy to lift we must leave him here to sleep on forever and perhaps he will dream that he has found courage at last i'm sorry said the scarecrow the lion was a very good comrade for one so cowardly but let us go on they carried the sleeping girl to a pretty spot beside the river far enough from the poppy field to prevent her breathing any more of the poison of the flowers and here they laid her gently on the soft grass and waited for the fresh breeze to waken her end of chapter eight the queen of the field mice we cannot be far from the road of yellow brick now remarked the scarecrow as he stood beside the girl for we have come nearly as far as the river carried us the tin woodman was about to reply when he heard a low growl then turning his head which worked beautifully on hinges he saw a strange beast come bounding over the grass toward them it was indeed a great yellow wildcat and the woodman thought it must be chasing something for its ears were lying close to its head and its mouth was wide open showing two rows of ugly teeth while its red eyes glowed like balls of fire as it came nearer the tin woodman saw that running before the beast was a little gray field mouse and although he had no heart he knew it was wrong for the wild cat to try to kill such a pretty harmless creature so the woodman raised his axe and as the wild cat ran by he gave it a quick blow that cut the beast's head clean off from its body and it rolled over at his feet in two pieces the field mouse now that it was freed from its enemy stopped short and coming slowly up to the woodman it said in a squeaky little voice oh thank you thank you ever so much for saving my life don't speak of it i beg you replied the woodman i have no heart you know so i am careful to help all those who may need a friend even if it happens to be only a mouse only a mouse cried the little animal indignantly why i am a queen the queen of all the field mice 
Oh, indeed, said the woodman, making a bow. Therefore you have done a great deed, as well as a brave one, in saving my life, added the queen. At that moment several mice were seen running up as fast as the little legs could carry them, and when they saw their queen they exclaimed, Oh, your majesty, we thought you would be killed. How did you manage to escape the great wildcat? They all bowed so low to the little queen that they almost stood on their heads. This funny tin man, she answered, killed the wildcat and saved my life. So hereafter you must all serve him and obey his slightest wish. We will, cried all the mice in a shrill chorus, and then they scampered in all directions, for Toto had awakened from his sleep, and seeing all these mice around him, he gave one bark of delight and jumped right into the middle of the group. Toto had always loved to chase mice when he lived in Kansas, and he saw no harm in it. But the tin woodman caught the dog in his arms and held him tight, while he called to the mice, Come back, come back, Toto shall not hurt you. At this the queen of the mice stuck her head out from underneath a clump of grass, and asked in a timid voice, Are you sure he will not bite us? I will not let him, said the woodman, so do not be afraid. One by one the mice came creeping back, and Toto did not bark again, although he tried to get out of the woodman's arms, and would have bitten him had he not known very well he was made of tin. Finally one of the biggest mice spoke. Is there anything we can do, it asked, to repay you for saving the life of our queen? Nothing that I know of answered the woodman. But the scarecrow, who had been trying to think, but could not because his head was stuffed with straw, said quickly, Oh, yes, you can save our friend, the cowardly lion, who is asleep in the poppy bed. A lion? cried the little queen. Why, he would eat us all up. Oh, no, declared the scarecrow. This lion is a coward. Really? asked the mouse. He says so himself, answered the scarecrow, and he would never hurt anyone who is our friend. If you will help us to save him, I promise that he shall treat you all with kindness. Very well, said the queen. We trust you, but what shall we do? Are there many of these mice which call you queen and are willing to obey you? Oh, yes, there are thousands, she replied. Then send for them all to come here as soon as possible, and let each one bring a long piece of string. The queen turned to the mice that attended her, and told them to go at once and get all her people. As soon as they heard her orders, they ran away in every direction as fast as possible. Now, said the scarecrow to the tin woodman, you must go to those trees by the riverside and make a truck that will carry the lion. So the woodman went at once to the trees and began to work, and soon he made a truck out of the limbs of trees, from which he chopped away all the leaves and branches. He fastened it together with wooden pegs and made the four wheels out of short pieces of a big tree trunk. So fast and so well did he work that by the time the mice began to arrive the truck was all ready for them. They came from all directions, and there were thousands of them, big mice and little mice and middle-sized mice, and each one brought a piece of string in his mouth. It was about this time that Dorothy woke from her long sleep and opened her eyes. She was greatly astonished to find herself lying upon the grass with thousands of mice standing around and looking at her timidly. But the scarecrow told her about everything, and, turning to the dignified little mouse, he said, Permit me to introduce to you Her Majesty the Queen. Dorothy nodded gravely, and the Queen made a curtsy, after which she became quite friendly with the little girl. The scarecrow and the woodman now began to fasten the mice to the truck, using the strings they had brought. One end of a string was tied around the neck of each mouse and the other end to the truck. Of course the truck was a thousand times bigger than any of the mice who were to draw it, 
but when all the mice had been harnessed they were able to pull it quite easily. Even the scarecrow and the tin woodman could sit on it and were drawn swiftly by their queer little horses to the place where the lion lay asleep. After a great deal of hard work, for the lion was heavy, they managed to get him up on the truck. Then the queen hurriedly gave her people the order to start, for she feared if the mice stayed among the poppies too long they also would fall asleep. At first the little creatures, many though they were, could hardly stir the heavily loaded truck, but the woodman and the scarecrow both pushed from behind, and they got along better. Soon they rolled the lion out of the poppy bed to the green fields, where he could breathe the sweet fresh air again, instead of the poisonous scent of the flowers. Dorothy came to meet them, and thanked the little mice warmly for saving her companion from death. She had grown so fond of the big lion, she was glad he had been rescued. Then the mice were unharnessed from the truck, and scampered away through the grass to their homes. The queen of the mice was the last to leave. "'If ever you need us again,' she said, "'come out into the field and call, and we shall hear you and come to your assistance. Good-bye.' "'Good-bye,' they all answered, and away the queen ran while Dorothy held Toto tightly, lest he should run after her and frighten her. After this they sat down beside the line until he should awaken, and the scarecrow brought Dorothy some fruit from a tree nearby, which she ate for her dinner. End of chapter 9 The Guardian of the Gate It was some time before the cowardly lion awakened, for he had lain among the poppies a long while, breathing in their deadly fragrance. But when he did open his eyes and roll off the truck, he was very glad to find himself still alive. "'I ran as fast as I could,' he said, sitting down and yawning. "'But the flowers were too strong for me. How did you get me out?' Then they told him of the field mice, and how they had generously saved him from death. And the cowardly lion laughed and said, <laughs> "'I have always thought myself very big and terrible. Yet such little things as flowers came near to killing me, and such small animals as mice have saved my life. How strange it all is! But, comrades, what shall we do now? We must journey on until we find the road of yellow brick again, said Dorothy, and then we can keep on to the Emerald City. So the lion, being fully refreshed, and feeling quite himself again, they all started upon the journey greatly enjoying the walk through the soft, fresh grass, and it was not long before they reached the road of yellow brick and turned again toward the Emerald City where the great Oz dwelt. The road was smooth and well paved now, and the country about was beautiful, so that the travelers rejoiced in leaving the forest far behind, and with it the many dangers they had met in its gloomy shades. Once more they could see fences built beside the road, but these were painted green, and when they came to a small house, in which a farmer evidently lived, that also was painted green. They passed by several of these houses during the afternoon, and sometimes people came to the doors and looked at them as if they would like to ask questions, but no one came near them nor spoke to them because of the great lion, of which they were very much afraid. The people were all dressed in clothing of a lovely emerald green color, and wore peaked hats like those of the munchkins. "'This must be the land of Oz,' said Dorothy, "'and we are surely getting near the Emerald City.' "'Yes,' answered the Scarecrow. "'Everything is green here, while in the country of the munchkins blue was the favorite color. But the people do not seem to be as friendly as the munchkins.' and I'm afraid we shall be unable to find a place to pass the night. I should like something to eat besides fruit, said the girl, and I'm sure Toto is nearly starved. Let us stop at the next house and talk to the people. So when they came to a good-sized farmhouse, Dorothy walked boldly up to the door and knocked. A woman opened it just far enough to look out, but said, what do you want, child, and why is that great lion with you? 
we wish to pass the night with you if you will allow us answered dorothy and the lion is my friend and comrade and would not hurt you for the world is he tame asked the woman opening the door a little wider oh yes said the girl and he is a great coward too he will be more afraid of you than you are of him well said the woman after thinking it over and taking another peep at the lion if that is the case you may come in and i will give you some supper and a place to sleep so they all entered the house where there were besides the woman two children and a man the man had hurt his leg and was lying on the couch in a corner they seemed greatly surprised to see so strange a company and while the woman was busy laying the table the man asked where are you all going to the emerald city said dorothy to see the great oz oh indeed exclaimed the man are you sure that oz will see you why not she replied well it is said that he never lets any one come into his presence i have been to the emerald city many times and it is a beautiful and wonderful place but i have never been permitted to see the great oz nor do i know of any living person who has seen him does he never go out asked the scarecrow never he sits day after day in the great throne room of his palace and even those who wait upon him do not see him face to face what is he like asked the girl that is hard to tell said the man thoughtfully you see oz is a great wizard and can take on any form he wishes so that some say he looks like a bird and some say he looks like an elephant and some say he looks like a cat to others he appears as a beautiful fairy or a brownie or in any other form that pleases him but who the real oz is when he is in his own form no living person can tell that is very strange said dorothy but we must try in some way to see him or we shall have made our journey for nothing why do you wish to see the terrible oz asked the man i want him to give me some brains said the scarecrow eagerly oh oz could do that easily enough declared the man he has more brains than he needs and i want him to give me a heart said the tin woodman that will not trouble him continued the man for oz has a large collection of hearts of all sizes and shapes and i want him to give me courage said the cowardly lion oz keeps a great pot of courage in his throne room said the man which he has covered with a golden plate to keep it from running over he will be glad to give you some and i want him to send me back to kansas said dorothy where is kansas asked the man with surprise i don't know replied dorothy sorrowfully but it is my home and i'm sure it's somewhere very likely well oz can do anything so i suppose he will find kansas for you but first you must get to see him and that will be a hard task for the great wizard does not like to see any one and he usually has his own way but what do you want he continued speaking to toto toto only wagged his tail for strange to say he could not speak the woman now called to them that supper was ready so they gathered around the table and dorothy ate some delicious porridge and a dish of scrambled eggs and a plate of nice white bread and enjoyed her meal the lion ate some of the porridge but did not care for it saying it was made from oats and oats were food for horses not for lions the scarecrow and the tin woodman ate nothing at all toto ate a little of everything and was glad to get a good supper again the woman now gave dorothy a bed to sleep in and toto lay down beside her while the lion guarded the door of her room so she might not be disturbed the scarecrow and the tin woodman stood up in a corner and kept quiet all night although of course they could not sleep the next morning as soon as the sun came up they started on their way and soon saw a beautiful green glow in the sky just before them that must be the emerald city said dorothy 
As they walked on, the green glow became brighter and brighter, and it seemed that at last they were nearing the end of their travels. Yet it was afternoon before they came to the great hall that surrounded the city. It was high and thick, and of a bright green color. In front of them, and at the end of the road of yellow brick, was a big gate, all studded with emeralds that glittered so in the sun that even the painted eyes of the scarecrow were dazzled by their brilliancy. There was a bell beside the gate, and Dorothy pushed the button and heard a silvery tinkle sound within. Then the big gate swung slowly open, and they all passed through and found themselves in a high arched room, the walls of which glistened with countless emeralds. Before them stood a little man about the same size as the munchkins. He was clothed all in green, from his head to his feet, and even his skin was of a greenish tint, and at his side was a large green box. When he saw Dorothy and her companions, the man asked, "'What do you wish in Emerald City?' "'We came here to see the great Oz,' said Dorothy. The man was so surprised at this answer that he sat down to think it over. "'It has been many years since anyone asked me to see Oz,' he said, shaking his head in perplexity. "'He is powerful and terrible, and if you come on an idle or foolish errand to bother the wise reflections of the great wizard, he might be angry and destroy you all in an instant. "'But it is not a foolish errand, nor an idle one,' replied the Scarecrow. "'It is important, and we have been told that Oz is a good wizard.' "'And so he is,' said the green man, "'and he rules the Emerald City wisely and well. But to those who are not honest, or who approach him from curiosity, he is most terrible.' and few have ever dared ask to see his face. I am the guardian of the gates, and since you demand to see the great Oz, I must take you to his palace. But first you must put on the spectacles. Why? asked Dorothy. Because if you do not wear spectacles, the brightness and glory of the Emerald City would blind you. Even those who live in the city must wear spectacles night and day. They are all locked on, for Oz so ordered it when the city was first built, and I have the only key that will unlock them. He opened the big box, and Dorothy saw that it was filled with spectacles of every size and shape. All of them had green glasses in them. The guardian of the gates found a pair that would just fit Dorothy and put them over her eyes. There were two golden bands fastened to them that passed around the back of her head, where they were locked together by a little key that was at the end of a chain the guardian of the gates wore around his neck. When they were on, Dorothy could not take them off had she wished, but of course she did not wish to be blinded by the glare of the Emerald City, so she said nothing. Then the green man fitted spectacles for the scarecrow and the tin woodman, and the lion, and even on little Toto, and all were locked fast with the key. Then the guardian of the gates put on his own glasses, and told them he was ready to show them to the palace. Taking a big golden key from a peg on the wall, he opened another gate, and they all followed him through the portal into the streets of the Emerald City. End of chapter 10 The Wonderful City of Oz Even with their eyes protected by the green spectacles, Dorothy and her friends were at first dazzled by the brilliancy of the wonderful city. The streets were lined with beautiful houses, all built of green marble, and studded everywhere with sparkling emeralds. They walked over a pavement of the same green marble, and where the blocks were joined together were rows of emeralds set closely and glittering in the brightness of the sun. The window panes were of green glass. Even the sky above the city had a green tint, and the rays of the sun were green. There were many people, men, women, and children, walking about, and these were all dressed in green clothes and had greenish skins. They looked at Dorothy and her strangely assorted company with wondering eyes, 
and the children all ran away and hid behind their mothers when they saw the lion, but no one spoke to them. Many shops stood in the street, and Dorothy saw that everything in them was green. Green candy and green popcorn were offered for sale, as well as green shoes, green hats, green clothes of all sorts. At one place a man was selling green lemonade, and when the children bought it, Dorothy could see that they paid for it with green pennies. There seemed to be no horses nor animals of any kind. The men carried things around in little green carts which they pushed before them. Everyone seemed happy and contented and prosperous. The guardian of the gates led them through the streets until they came to a big building, exactly in the middle of the city, which was the palace of Oz the Great Wizard. There was a soldier before the door, dressed in a green uniform and wearing a long green beard. Here are strangers, said the guardian of the gates to him, and they demand to see the great Oz. Step inside, answered the soldier, and I will carry your message to him. So they passed through the palace gates and were led into a big room with a green carpet and lovely green furniture set with emeralds. The soldier made them all wipe their feet upon a green mat before entering this room, and when they were seated he said politely, Please make yourself comfortable while I go to the door of the throne room and tell Oz you are here. They had to wait a long time before the soldier returned. When at last he came back Dorothy asked, Have you seen Oz? Oh, no, returned the soldier. I have never seen him. But I spoke to him as he sat behind his screen, and gave him your message. He says he will grant you an audience, if you so desire, but each one of you must enter his presence alone, and he will admit but one each day. Therefore, as you must remain in the palace for several days, I will have you shown to rooms where you may rest in comfort after your journey. Thank you, replied the girl. That is very kind of Oz. The soldier now blew upon a green whistle, and at once a young girl, dressed in a pretty green silk gown, entered the room. She had lovely green hair and green eyes, and she bowed low before Dorothy as she said, Follow me, and I will show you your room. So Dorothy said good-bye to all her friends except Toto, and, taking the dog in her arms, followed the green girl through seven passages and up three flights of stairs, until they came to a room at the front of the palace. It was the sweetest little room in the world, with a soft, comfortable bed that had sheets of green silk and a green velvet counterpane. There was a tiny fountain in the middle of the room that shot a spray of green perfume into the air to fall back into a beautifully carved green marble basin. Beautiful green flowers stood in the windows, and there was a shelf with a row of little green books. When Dorothy had time to open these books, she found them full of queer green pictures that made her laugh they were so funny. In a wardrobe were many green dresses made of silk and satin and velvet, and all of them fitted Dorothy exactly. Make yourself perfectly at home, said the green girl, and if you wish for anything, ring the bell. Oz will send for you tomorrow morning. She left Dorothy alone and went back to the others. These she also led to rooms, and each one of them found himself lodged in a very pleasant part of the palace. Of course, this politeness was wasted on the scarecrow, for when he found himself alone in his room, he stood stupidly in one spot, just within the doorway, to wait till morning. It would not rest him to lie down, and he could not close his eyes, so he remained all night staring at a little spider which was weaving its web in a corner of the room, just as if it were not one of the most wonderful rooms in the world. The tin woodman lay down on his bed from force of habit, for he remembered when he was made of flesh, but not being able to sleep, he passed the night moving his joints up and down to make sure they kept in good working order. The lion would have preferred a bed of dried leaves in the forest, and did not like being shut up in a room, but he had too much sense to let this worry him. 
so he sprang upon the bed and rolled himself up like a cat and purred himself asleep in a minute. The next morning after breakfast the green maiden came to fetch Dorothy, and she dressed her in one of the prettiest gowns made of green brocaded satin. Dorothy put on a green silk apron and tied a green ribbon around Toto's neck, and they started for the throne room of the great Oz. First they came to a great hall, in which were many ladies and gentlemen of the court, all dressed in rich costumes. These people had nothing to do but talk to each other, but they always came to wait outside the throne room every morning, although they were never permitted to see Oz. As Dorothy entered, they looked at her curiously, and one of them whispered, Are you really going to look upon the face of Oz the Terrible? Of course, answered the girl, if he will see me. Oh, he will see you, said the soldier, who had taken her message to the wizard, although he does not like to have people ask to see him. Indeed, at first he was angry, and said I should send you back where you came from. Then he asked me what you looked like, and when I mentioned your silver shoes, he was very much interested. At last I told him about the mark upon your forehead, and he decided he would admit you to his presence. Just then the bell rang, and the green girl said to Dorothy, That is the signal. You must go into the throne room alone. She opened a little door, and Dorothy walked boldly through, and found herself in a wonderful place. It was a big round room with a high arched roof, and the walls and ceiling and floor were covered with large emeralds set closely together. In the center of the room was a great light as bright as the sun which made the emeralds sparkle in a wonderful manner. But what interested Dorothy most was the big throne of green marble that stood in the middle of the room. It was shaped like a chair and sparkled with gems as did everything else. In the center of the chair was an enormous head without a body to support it or any arms or legs whatever. There was no hair upon this head, but it had eyes and a nose and mouth and was much bigger than the head of the biggest giant. As Dorothy gazed upon this in wonder and fear, the eyes turned slowly and looked at her sharply and steadily. Then the mouth moved, and Dorothy heard a voice say, I am Oz the Great and Terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? It was not such an awful voice as she had expected to come from the big head, so she took courage and answered, I am Dorothy the Small and Meek. I have come to you for help. Then the eyes looked at her thoughtfully for a full minute. Then the voice said, Where did you get the silver shoes? I got them from the Wicked Witch of the East when my house fell on her and killed her," she replied. Where did you get the mark upon your forehead? continued the voice. That is where the Good Witch of the North kissed me when she bade me good-bye and sent me to you," said the girl. Again the eyes looked at her sharply, and they saw she was telling the truth. Then Oz asked, What do you wish me to do? Send me back to Kansas, where my Aunt Em and Uncle Henry are," she answered earnestly. I don't like your country, although it is so beautiful, and I am sure Aunt Em would be dreadfully worried over my being away so long. The eyes winked three times, and then they turned up to the ceiling and down to the floor, and rolled around so queerly that they seemed to see every part of the room and at last they looked at Dorothy again. "'Why should I do this for you?' asked Oz. "'Because you are strong, and I am weak, because you are a great wizard, and I am only a little girl.' "'But you were strong enough to kill the Wicked Witch of the East,' said Oz. "'That just happened,' returned Dorothy simply. "'I could not help it.' "'Well,' said the head, "'I will give you my answer. You have no right to expect me to send you back to Kansas unless you do something for me in return. In this country everyone must pay for everything he gets. If you wish me to use my magic power to send you home again, you must do something for me first. 
Help me, and I will help you. What must I do? asked the girl. Kill the wicked witch of the West, answered Oz. But I cannot, exclaimed Dorothy, greatly surprised. You kill the witch of the East, and you wear the silver shoes, which is a powerful charm. There is now but one wicked witch left in all this land, and when you can tell me she is dead, I will send you back to Kansas, but not before." The little girl began to weep. She was so much disappointed, and the eyes winked again and looked upon her anxiously, as if the great Oz felt that she could help him if she would. I never killed anything willingly, she sobbed. Even if I wanted to, how could I kill the wicked witch? If you, who are great and terrible, cannot kill her yourself, how do you expect me to do it? I do not know, said the head, but that is my answer. And until the wicked witch dies, you will not see your uncle and aunt again. Remember that the witch is wicked, tremendously wicked, and ought to be killed. Now go, and do not ask to see me again until you have done your task." Sorrowfully Dorothy left the throne room, and went back where the lion and scarecrow and the tin woodman were waiting to hear what Oz had said to her. "'There is no hope for me,' she said sadly, "'for Oz will not send me home until I have killed the wicked witch of the West and that I can never do. Her friends were sorry, but could do nothing to help her. So Dorothy went to her own room, and lay down on the bed and cried herself to sleep. The next morning the soldier with the green whiskers came to the scarecrow and said, Come with me, for Oz has sent for you. So the scarecrow followed him, and was admitted into the great throne room, where he saw, sitting in the emerald throne, a most lovely lady. She was dressed in green silk gauze, and wore upon her flowing green locks a crown of jewels. Growing from her shoulders were wings, gorgeous in color, and so light that they fluttered if the slightest breath of air reached them. When the scarecrow had bowed as prettily as his straw stuffing would let him before this beautiful creature, she looked upon him sweetly and said, I am Oz, the Great and Terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me?" Now the Scarecrow, who had expected to see the great head Dorothy had told him of, was much astonished, but he answered her bravely, "'I am only a Scarecrow, stuffed with straw, therefore I have no brains, and I come to you praying that you will put brains in my head instead of straw, so that I may become as much a man as any other in your dominions. Why should I do this for you?' asked the lady. "'Because you are wise and powerful, and no one else can help me,' answered the Scarecrow. "'I never grant favors without some return,' said Oz. "'But this much I will promise. If you will kill for me the wicked witch of the West, I will bestow upon you a great many brains, and such good brains that you will be the wisest man in all the land of Oz.' "'I thought you asked Dorothy to kill the witch.' said the Scarecrow in surprise. So I did. I don't care who kills her, but until she is dead I will not grant your wish. Now go and do not seek me again until you have earned the brains you so greatly desire." The Scarecrow went sorrowfully back to his friends and told them what Oz had said, and Dorothy was surprised to find that the great wizard was not a head, as she had seen him, but a lovely lady. All the same, said the Scarecrow, she needs a heart as much as the Tin Woodman. On the next morning the soldier with the green whiskers came to the Tin Woodman and said, Oz has sent for you, follow me. So the Tin Woodman followed him and came to the great throne room. He did not know whether he would find Oz a lovely lady or a head, but he hoped it would be the lovely lady, for, he said to himself, I am sure I shall not be given a heart, since a head has no heart of its own and therefore cannot feel for me. But if it is the lovely lady, I shall beg hard for a heart, for all ladies are themselves said to be kindly hearted. But when the woodman entered the great throne room, he saw neither the head nor the lady, for Oz had taken the shape of a most terrible beast. 
It was nearly as big as an elephant, and the green throne seemed hardly strong enough to hold its weight. The beast had a head like that of a rhinoceros. Only there were five eyes in its face. There were five long arms growing out of its body, and it also had five long, slim legs. Thick, woolly hair covered every part of it, and a more dreadful-looking monster could not be imagined. It was fortunate the Tin Woodman had no heart at that moment, for it would have beat loud and fast from terror. But being only tin, the Woodman was not at all afraid, although he was much disappointed. "'I am Oz the Great and Terrible,' spoke the beast, in a voice that was one great roar. "'Who are you, and why do you seek me?' "'I am a woodman, and made of tin. Therefore I have no heart, and cannot love. I pray you to give me a heart that I may be as other men are.' "'Why should I do this?' demanded the beast. "'Because I ask it, and you alone can grant my request,' answered the woodman. Oz gave a low growl at this, but said gruffly, "'If you indeed desire a heart, you must earn it.' "'How?' asked the woodman. "'Help Dorothy to kill the wicked Witch of the West,' replied the beast. "'When the witch is dead, come to me, and I will then give you the biggest and kindest and most loving heart in all the land of Oz.' So the Tin Woodman was forced to return sorrowfully to his friends, and tell them of the terrible beast he had seen. They all wondered greatly at the many forms the great wizard could take upon himself, and the lion said, "'If he is a beast, when I go to see him, I shall roar my loudest, and so frighten him that he will grant all I ask. And if he is the lovely lady, I shall pretend to spring upon her, and so compel her to do my bidding.' And if he is the great head, he will be at my mercy, for I will roll this head all about the room until he promises to give us what we desire. So be of good cheer, my friends, for all will yet be well." The next morning the soldier with the green whiskers led the lion to the great throne room and bade him enter the presence of Oz. The lion at once passed through the door and, glancing around, saw to his surprise that before the throne was a ball of fire, so fierce and glowing he could scarcely bear to gaze upon it. His first thought was that Oz had by accident caught on fire and was burning up, but when he tried to go nearer the heat was so intense that it singed his whiskers, and he crept back tremblingly to a spot nearer the door. Then. A low, quiet voice came from the ball of fire, and these were the words it spoke. I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? And the lion answered, I am a cowardly lion, afraid of everything. I came to you to beg that you give me courage, so that in reality I may become the king of beasts, as men call me. Why should I give you courage? demanded Oz. Be "'Because of all the wizards you are the greatest, and alone have power to grant my request,' answered the lion. The ball of fire burned fiercely for a time, and the voice said, "'Bring me proof that the wicked witch is dead, and that moment I will give you courage. But as long as the witch lives you must remain a coward.' The lion was angry at this speech, but could say nothing in reply and while he stood silently gazing at the ball of fire it became so furiously hot that he turned tail and rushed from the room he was glad to find his friends waiting for him and told them of his terrible interview with the wizard what shall we do now asked dorothy sadly there is only one thing we can do returned the lion and that is to go to the land of the winkies seek out the wicked witch and destroy her. But suppose we cannot, said the girl. Then I shall never have courage, declared the lion, and I shall never have brains, added the scarecrow, and I shall never have a heart, spoke the tin woodman, and I shall never see Aunt Em and Uncle Henry, said Dorothy, beginning to cry. Be careful, cried the green girl, 
the tears will fall on your green silk gown and spot it. So Dorothy dried her eyes and said, I suppose we must try it, but I am sure I do not want to kill anybody, even to see Aunt Em again. I will go with you, but I am too much of a coward to kill the witch, said the lion. I will go too, declared the scarecrow, but I shall not be of much help to you. I am such a fool. I haven't the heart to harm even a witch, replied the tin woodman, but if you go, I certainly shall go with you. Thereupon it was decided to start upon their journey the next morning, and the woodman sharpened his axe on a green grindstone, and had all his joints properly oiled. The scarecrow stuffed himself with fresh straw, and Dorothy put new paint on his eyes that he might see better. The green girl, who was very kind to them, filled Dorothy's basket with good things to eat, and fastened a little bell around Toto's neck with a green ribbon. They went to bed quite early and slept soundly until daylight, when they were awakened by the crowing of a green cock that lived in the back yard of the palace, and the cackling of a hen that had laid a green egg. End of chapter 11